All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, this is Elevate Northeast, the first of our 2021 Community Conversation events. Um, this is a program that we started back in 2018. And, um, you know, you know, all know how last year went. Um, so we're excited to get everybody back together virtually, um, but still together to have an important conversation and and um, to learn from some really, really impressive and um, experienced uh, thought leaders that we have here today. Um, first of all, of course, uh, none of this would be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. Um, we give big thanks to MCR Labs uh, for being our series sponsor. So they're sponsoring all three of our upcoming events today. And then we have an event coming up in September and October as well. So stay tuned for those in the series here. And then we also have the support today from Rise Dispensaries. So thank, we thank both of them very much for making this all possible. Um, so just quickly, uh, very simple agenda. <laughs> Welcome, we're getting through that. A couple quick announcements about Elevate and uh, then we'll introduce our speakers and get into today's conversation. And um, thank you to those who submitted some questions when you signed up for today's event. Uh, we've definitely taken a look at those and hope to be able to incorporate as many as those as we can into the conversation later. And we'll also take questions from the audience as well. So first of all, um, in addition to thanking our sponsors, of course, thank you to our thought leaders. We'll learn a little bit more about them um, in just a few minutes, but we have Vanessa Jean-Baptiste, who's the president of Legal Greens Dispensary in Brockton, Massachusetts. Tahir Johnson, who's the director of social equity and inclusion at Marijuana Policy Project. Jason Ortiz, Executive Director at Students for Sensible Drug Policy, Cheney Turner, who's the Chair of the Open Cannabis Commission, and our girl, Tashonda Vincent Lee, our uh, Director of Community Outreach here at Elevate. Um, again, thank you to MCR. If you don't know MCR Labs, they're a uh, cannabis testing laboratory, one of the first here in Massachusetts. They're based in Framingham, Massachusetts. Uh, if you have you know, your business uh, um, marijuana products that you need to get tested or you're just a, a person, maybe you've gotten some, some cannabis you know, somewhere and you want to get it tested or you're curious you know, about the, the THC or the cannabinoids in there, um, individuals and businesses can use MCR Labs. You can go to mcrlabs.com or shoot an email to hello at mcrlabs.com to get started. Um, they've been a longtime supporter of Elevate, so we're very grateful for their continued support of the conversation series this year. Another big thanks to Rise, Rise Dispensaries. Um, they're part of Green Thumb Industries, but Rise has a dispensary in Amherst, Mass. Um, and they also have a bunch of dispensaries in, uh, across the Northeast in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, um, and a few more states outside of the Northeast as well. Um, so next time you're in Amherst, go check them out. Uh, thank you to Berkshire Roots for helping out on the social media. And thank you to our community partners, Eon and Minorities for Medical Marijuana. Um, these are two great organizations, so please check them out and support them. Um, always great to collaborate with these guys. Um, big announcement. Uh, you may have seen some of our social, but um, the enrollment is open for the Massachusetts uh, Cannabis Control Commission's uh, social equity program. Um, enrollment right now, the deadline to enroll is September 17th, so it's coming up, and we're going to have um, some more announcements coming up um, about how we're supporting enrollment um, and supporting the, the CCC to get as many uh, people in, involved in the program um, as possible. Um, but it's a free technical assistance program, resources, education, um, connections, um, really meant to, to help uh, better position people who've been um, you know, most uh, disproportionately harmed by the war on drugs and marijuana prohibition, just to get them um, a leg up in this industry and get them educated about how to how to start a business. Um, go to masscannabiscontrol.com uh, slash equity programs to learn more and stay tuned because we'll be talking some more about it as well. Um, another big announcement, we're actually this week just started to award our first round of um, scholarships uh, for the, the Holyoke Community College uh, Cannabis Core Program. So we're really excited about that. Um, and thank all the other people that have made all the people and businesses that have made donations to make this possible. We're awarding eight scholarships. Um, so that's pretty awesome uh, for, for the fall pro programs. Um, so stay tuned for more on that as well. Uh, but we are, of course, always taking uh, donations for the education scholarship. So uh, please visit elevateny.org to learn more about that. Um, and last but not least on our, our uh, orders of business here, we do have a new elevateny.org, a brand new website. It's been a project we've been working on for some time, and we're really excited to share it with um, all our individual members, our business members, and just the community. Uh, we're adding new information all the time, new resources just to help people um, understand cannabis, understand the industry, and understand some opportunities. Um, so please check it out. 
And okay, now I'm gonna hand it over to Tashonda Vincent Lee, our Director of Community uh, Outreach here to get this uh, conversation started. So Tashonda, you ready? I am, thank you so much, Ba. Take it away. Yes, so first of all, welcome everyone. It's so great to be back. Um, I'm pretty sure we all kind of feel the same, like we've been under a rock for the past year, but we've also been overworked and stretched. It's amazing how much you can get done when you can't and aren't supposed to be doing much at all. Um, so um, this is fun times and we're really, really, really excited to have our community conversation series um, back again and to have it kick off with this wonderful, I'm just gonna go ahead and just tell you, I myself was a little bit nervous today because I realized that I am literally moderating a panel of individuals whom I have been fanning out um, about for the past couple of years, to be honest. Um, the unique thing about being in this particular industry um, and being a person of color, uh, there aren't very many of us in this particular space as it relates to advocacy and activism. Um, however, those of us who are here and are making um, impacts, you, you definitely have this line of sight to one another. So it's sort of like been for me, not even a full one degree of separation. It feels like it's been like more of a quarter of a degree of separation. Um, so it's like, I see you and I'm like, oh my God, this person's doing amazing work. Like, I hope I get to meet them one day and seriously, like there'll be an event and then I meet you. So, um, and or I have, we have this wonderful, you know, full opportunity of, of edutainment um, and I'm able to call on you and ask and, and, and request that you show up and not only do you show up you show up and you show out so I'm really excited to have you all and to host you all here um, so what I want to do is just so you're not hearing my voice I would love for these individuals to introduce themselves um, let's tell the community a little bit about who you are um, whom you're with now I know everyone probably has like seven titles feel free <laughs> to share at least three to four um, in the interest of time. Uh, just let us know what brought you to this work um, and then we'll, we'll get started from there. Sounds good. Um, Chaney, if, if it's okay, I'd love to kick it off with you. Sure, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon from Oakland, California. Um, my name is uh, Chaney Turner, uh, them, they, she pronouns. Um, again, I reside in uh, Oakland, California, currently um, sit on the Open Cannabis Commissions, um, was just appointed chair a week ago, so <laughs> um, that's uh, something new, but I have been in the, uh, the cannabis space for uh, about five years, um, like most people, started on the, you know, illicit market, um, providing medicine to friends and, you know, people uh, in my community. Um, and um, I've always been a person that's been active uh, in the community around um, any, you know, social justice issues, um, uh, displacement, gentrification of, you know, black and brown folks, um, um, police state sanctioned violence. And so being in cannabis, if, for me personally, um, uh, coming in on the ad advocacy side was something that I was supposed to do. That we're all that we feel like we're all supposed to do. But at just being, you know, who I am, um, wanted to be more involved, um, especially being here in California and seeing how things was going with uh, 64. And luckily, you know, Oakland had the hindsight to uh, see that as well by introducing, you know, social equity uh, programs. Um, uh, I also um, have my own organization that uh, extends that um, equity work, which is called Beyond Equity, um, uh, which focuses on uh, education, uh, which is very important um, uh, with the communities that uh, especially being targeted and harmed um, and in accuracy. Um, so very glad to be here with uh, some peers that uh, I definitely uh, admire. So thanks for having me today. Thank you so much, Chaney. We're, we're so happy that you're here with us and congratulations on the new appointment. That is awesome. So we have a, we have a chair, a commissioner chair with us this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so that's wonderful. Congratulations again. Um, Jason, would you like to introduce yourself? 
she's a regulator. You know, Cheney's regulating out there. Like it's not even just some little committee, you know, let's be real. So uh, my name is Jason Ortiz. I'm currently the executive director of Students for Sensible Drug Policy, which is a global youth led nonprofit that seeks to mobilize young people to change all drug policies in their communities. And so cannabis is one of those, but it is all drugs. Uh, just to be very clear there. And so, you know, there are plenty of folks in the cannabis industry space we'll have to have that conversation with, uh, and it's coming, especially with the psychedelic industry right on our tails, right? Uh, but I recently uh, finished up a term as president of the Minority Cannabis Business Association, MCBA, uh, where it was a uh, trade association of people that wanted to get into the cannabis industry who were people of color, but also wanted to start to write our own laws and to take what we learned from the folks in Oakland and, you know, apply that nationally in lots of different places and DC and Texas and here in Connecticut. I'm based here in Hartford, Connecticut. So the third hat that I'm coming into this with is as the policy director for CureCT, Connecticut United for Reform and Equity. That was the primary organization pushing for equity and cannabis legalization push just this past year. And we did pass cannabis legalization here in Connecticut. And it was a nasty, dirty fight that I look forward into describing. But you know, back in 2000, I was arrested for cannabis uh, possession when I was in high school. That was beginning of me really getting involved in drug policy, learning exactly what terms like the war on drugs, the school to prison pipeline, and selective enforcement, which is my favorite one, uh, meant to my community. And so that brought me into the policy space. Uh, but it was orgs and people that worked in the drug policy space, like SSDP, like all of us here today, that changed the Higher Education Act's federal aid elimination penalty. That was the very specific law that denied financial aid for anyone with a drug conviction. So because of the activists that came before me, I was able to go to college and learn about SSDP. So it was both negatively impacted by the war, but also positively impacted by the activism. And then once I kind of put it all together, I knew I was gonna be a drug policy activist uh, henceforth, you know? And so now we're figuring out how to kind of extend the lessons learned in the equity space to issues like international equity, international reparations, and how do we finally end the war on drugs completely uh, in Congress? Oh, you're, you're on mute. You're, you're muted. It's nothing like having a good conversation with yourself, right? <laughs> um, Jason, I, I, I'll, I'll remember you always and forever. I, I've given you a nickname in my head. Um, you're the enforcer. So I actually attended the Minority Cannabis Business Association Policy Summit. <laughs> and someone asked a question regarding the difference in um, the events with uh, MCBA and other organizations and you politely basically said, we'll follow the money. Um, and then that will let you know basically why the difference exists. Um, and I just remember thinking, I appreciate him for being so transparent. Like you didn't, you weren't PC about or anything. You took the mic. <laughs> I think it was for Shanita. And you were like, so here's what it is. And I, I, I will say he's, he's the enforcer. He's going to tell us the truth at all times. So I appreciate that. Um, thank you so much for being here. And last but not least, the incomparable, amazing Vanessa, who I am formally just meeting today all, but I have to tell you us both being in Massachusetts um, and then being a part of Elevate, I, I remember coming across your scholarship application. So that's how far this goes back, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I would love for you to introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Vanessa Jean Baptiste. I have a bachelor's in criminal justice and I am the owner of Legal Greens and we opened in March, which made me the first woman, the Afri first African woman to open in the East Coast. Yes, yes, yes. So um, we've been open since March and things have been going great, literally, can't complain. Oh, wow. Congratulations on all of your success. Listen, Legal Greens yeah. is banging it out of the park. They were just <laughs> partying with Dave East, I think, like a week ago. So listen, <laughs> it is it is popping over at Legal Greens. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, Vanessa. It, it's Thank really you, great. Yeah. It's, yes, it's awesome to be able to have someone who we saw as a student who's now an owner and operator like in this space. Like it Yes, it yes. lets us know that it's actually possible. So it's so great to have you here and to have you in this space. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, guys.
All right, so let's get into the meat and potatoes of this thing, right? So I'm just going to lay it out for you all. I know we sent over, I sent you over our questions um, just to let you know there were some um, submissions, uh, pre-event submissions. So we already have some questions and I'm seeing some live questions come through as well. So what we want to do is because this is our community conversation series, we want to make sure that we're, we have enough time for the community, not enough time. We actually want to allocate more time for them. So in the event that we don't get to some of the questions that I sent you all previously, just know it's because we want to make sure that the community is heard. So we'll skip over to that to make sure we don't miss them. Does that sound good? All right. So I think this is a great place to start. Uh, we always we try to set the stage of why we're here, uh, what we expect to learn. We provided the goals beforehand, um, but basically we're here to talk all things equity and to be very transparent as, as, as transparent as we can be. And, and knowing all of you all, I think we're gonna be very transparent. So there should be a lot of value added. Um, but my first question is understanding that we all have differing ideals of what equity means. Um, specifically as it relates to the cannabis industry, what does equity mean to you? And, and Cheney, I'm going to actually toss this to you first, given your work on the commission. And, and it would be nice to have that regulated perspective, if you will, on the definition of equity. Um, for me, uh, for me personally, um, equity, equity is about justice. Um, correcting the you know injustices um any time there is an industry or something that's uh, inaccessible to a certain group of people um that's an injustice and for cannabis uh particularly um of course we're talking about a uh industry that is being built off of uh, pain and trauma of communities uh, that have been harmed by the drug war. And so um, we have to make the pathways equitable and just. And so, um, and we're talking about cannabis, but again, that can go for uh, anything that is uh, inaccessible, uh, housing, um, um, other basic needs that, uh, that we need in order to, uh, to survive. But when it comes to cannabis, uh, it's, a, it's a justice, uh, social justice issue. Thank you for that. And I wanted, I wanted to, to actually flash it over to you, Vanessa, but to hear has just joined us. And what I don't want to do is miss the opportunity for him to introduce himself um, Tahir, thank you so much for joining us. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was going to start sending smoke signals. I, I'm telling you, I was I had the jet like right here. I was telling my people, listen, I need you to pull him, do whatever we need to do to get him on this computer. So <laughs> we're glad that you joined us. Um, we already did introductions. Why don't we, we give you a couple of minutes just to, you know, introduce yourself. Um, tell us, you know, what, what brought you to the industry um, and it's specifically as it relates to equity. So. Absolutely. And so sorry that I'm late, y'all. It's, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, shout out to all the folks, um, all everybody in Massachusetts and everywhere else that's tuning in. Um, but my name is Tahir Johnson, and I'm the Director of Social Equity and Inclusion for the Marijuana Policy Project, as well as the U.S. Cannabis Council. Um, in my role there, I'm helping to develop um, pro, um, social equity programs that we're going to um, put in place across um, all of our member companies. Um, as well as um, I get to work on policy. Um, so on, on the marijuana policy project side, I'm working on state policy to try to ensure that, that there's equitable policy, as well as um, on the USCC side, working on federal policy um, to, like, and to make sure that social equity is a part of um, the policy that, that we promote um, at the US Cannabis Council. Um, I got into the cannabis industry uh, myself. I started in 2018. Um, prior to cannabis, I was in financial services. Um, and when I looked at the industry, um, I saw the need um, and the importance of access to capital being one of the biggest things that on um, the biggest barriers for um, our people to be able to participate in the industry. So I wanted to be able to make a difference. Um, you know, when you look at the cannabis industry, one of the biggest things that um, keep us out is, you know, 
not having money, right? You know, it's there's complex regulatory systems. Um, they require capital, real estate, all these types of things to get in the industry. And as somebody who has spent my whole career in finance and financial literacy, I wanted to be um, dedicated to help make an impact here. Um, and right now with, with so much going on in legalization on both the state and federal level, we have a lot of opportunity to try to make sure we get this right. And that cannabis can be a um, tool for our communities to, um, you know, have access to wealth instead of um, what has been, you know, used as a tool to oppress us and for um, incarceration for so long. So I'm happy to get to be a part of that. And shout out to all my folks on here, Chaney, Jason, I see y'all, what's up? Vanessa, a pleasure to meet you. I told you all, there's like just a three quarters of a degree of separation in, <laughs> in this work that we do. Uh, Tahir, it's wonderful to have you. I do have a question for you. This is off color. Are you from Baltimore? Um, I'm originally from Trenton, New Jersey, but I, I've been in Maryland for, for quite a little bit of time now, 20 years now, okay. to the Maryland area. Okay, okay. You're a Marylander now. If you've been here for 20 years, you're a Marylander. I am, I am. But it's okay, we'll <laughs> let you go home. You can go home and visit, but you're a I'm in, Jersey. I'm in Jersey right now as we speak, though, if that counts for anything. <laughs> I, it may be the mix of two, but you have a little bit of a Baltimore accent going on. That's why I asked. I was like, oh, I hear that draw. Let me ask. <laughs> With my accent, who even knows where I'm from these days? I get around <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> well, welcome to here. So happy to have you. Um sure. So we're going to jump back in it. Um, Jason, I'm going to ask you the same question. What's your definition of equity and why is it important as it specifically relates to the cannabis industry? And if there's one question that like defines my 30s that I feel like I've had to wake up every single day to figure out how I'm going to define and redefine is the word equity. So my boilerplate pitch is that equity is ensuring that the communities most impacted by the war on drugs are the primary beneficiaries of legalization. Right. And so how we define who is impacted, how we define beneficiaries, right, gets into a lot of different places. But there are some very clear communities that were definitely disproportionately impacted, both anecdotal evidence between our communities, but also data. Right. That black and brown folks were arrested, harassed, disrupted and had their possessions stolen from them. Right. The capital that many folks use to, say, leverage in order to get capital investment, they might be able to put a lien on their house in order to start that business. Got to own a house to be able to do that. And all the folks that lost their house because the cops came in and raided and disrupted their family don't have that capital to operate, right? So it is a material consideration, right? When we think about the communities that are most impacted, there are financial data points that we can use to understand who those people are. Now, the benefits of legalization are manifold, and all of them should primarily go to the folks that were uh, most impacted. The way we did this, especially in MCBA, but generally speaking, was to kind of put those benefits into three buckets. Criminal justice reform and reentry support. So making sure the folks that got arrested are released, right? But even beyond that, the folks that are released have financial support to get their uh, personal issues in order, however they see fit. Um, but also, you know, making sure that they have the ability to get a job in the new industry or jobs in other places that are not in the new industry, right? But that is the individual was specifically impacted by that kind of piece of it. But entire communities were disrupted, right? We had redlined entire neighborhoods and those folks got over-policed by community, right? And so the reinvestment of tax dollars in community investment, that's the second bucket is community investment of tax revenue, broadly into a community to say support healthcare facilities or to rebuild a school or to rebuild infrastructure that folks may need, right? It could even be something as simple as water, right? Like we have plenty of communities that don't have access to clean water because of you know a lack of attention to our communities. And then lastly is ownership, right? This tends to take it the form and fighting over licensing right now um, and how licensing impacts our ability to start businesses, but making sure that if we are going to let anybody sell cannabis, that the communities most impacted are included in the people that are allowed to sell cannabis. And in Connecticut, the biggest fight from day one was not only how do we define equity, but who gets to define equity? Because in the fight, I was actually part of the governor's original task force to define equity. They wanted to remove criminal justice from that definition. And like, I was blown away of like how, how, right? Like, it just like, that should be the foundation of it. And as they stacked the narrative in the public mind with other folks, right? We started to really lose control over who is allowed to define equity. Now we had various corporate lobbyists that are pushing different pieces. 
we wanted to make sure that we had lots of people sort of supported and in, in, in the picture. So as the bill developed, someone with a criminal history was included in the equity programs right up until the very end where a new version of the bill came out, they were taken out and it was geographic only. There was an immediate fight in a special session, like legit, this was passed on a Monday and we had to figure out how we were gonna get it figured out the next day where they removed the criminal history qualifier. And we had to decide, are we gonna shut the whole bill down over this? Can we even shut the whole bill down over this, right? In that fight, as we're figuring this out, the governor says, our effort to put criminal history back into the equity program was an effort to help rich white kids at universities that got popped for a joint get a license because it was our friends, right? I want to repeat that, that our effort to add the criminal history qualifier back in was an effort to let the rich white kids at university studies, they literally said Yale and Wesleyan, like they specifically quoted students at Yale and Wesleyan who got popped for a J into the equity programs. So they were able to switch not only what the definition is, but that we were the ones trying to manipulate the process and they were the ones protecting all of the poor black and brown people from my personal interests, right? And so the level of narrative perversion that I got to see towards the end of the Connecticut effort was I, I, you know, and I don't have the most loving view of my own state most of the time, but I wasn't even cynical enough to think that they would go there, right? Of really framing me as the impediment to progress here. And so, you know, it was definitely a wild ride as far as not just like what the definition is, but who gets to define it? How are we defining it in the public? Because sometimes we can have the greatest idea in the world, but if someone else has a bigger megaphone, their definition stands. Absolutely. Wow. I, Cheney, I don't want to cut you off. Go ahead. Oh, no, I want to say um, he's absolutely right, you know, in everything that he said, uh, even for existing, you know, programs like here in Oakland, we're still redefining, right? I mean, the bottom line is black and brown people and folks who were actually targeted, right? By the drug war, but we can't use that language. We can't say that we have, you know, a certain percentage, certain percentage have to go to black folks who were harmed or this, you can't define it, you know, by race. So we're having to find all of you know these other languages, but even with the current language, as cities continue, you know, uh, to change the demographic, just because you live in a certain neighborhood doesn't now currently doesn't mean that you were affected by the drug war on drugs twenty years ago. Uh, in a city like Oakland that is heavily gentrified, um, you're now having people who are trying to uh, apply, you know, for, uh, for equity because they live in a certain beat, you know, that, uh, uh, that qualifies or they are, you know, partnering with uh, 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 people who might have formerly lived in a neighborhood but have the financial means. And so it's always evolving as the industry uh, evolves and um, as, again, demographics change and, and also, you know, regulation, um, even on a state level, we're looking at redefining what the actual definition is so that the people that these programs were created for are still included. Yes, I, I, we completely, I, I know that, Vanessa, this probably all sounds like deja vu to you, given um, our experience in Massachusetts and, and what happened, to be honest. It's the same, I, I don't want to say it's the same across board, but it, it is, um, unfortunately. It, it sounds is. Like so, oh, sorry to cut you off. Yeah, it is. It is. It's um, with my whole process. It was literally a fight on just trying to get with into the to the legal market. We we I I got my social I got um with the state. They did their whole economic empowerment thing and I applied for that and I was granted it before the regulations were even finalized with the state. So then once they did the state, um, once they put their applications out, I would have priority. And when I became a social equity applicant, I went to my local city, which I was born and raised in, went to school. And that was one of the cities, Brockton is one of the cities at Massachusetts. So 
when I went to my local mayor, he basically shut me off and told me that he had already given it out to his people that he decided was equitable or whatever the case may be. And it was literally all rich, rich white folks that got the host agreement. So with that in health, I had to like fight, literally be an advocate, go on the news, like go to every city council meeting that I could go to and just speak about how social equity wasn't um, a priority and in this marijuana industry. And this is a city that has been disproportionately aff affected by the war on drugs. So something has to be done here. And the mayor like died and somehow by the graces of the Lord and uh, the first African-American became mayor within the city of Brockton. And he was uh, strictly opened it for social equity applicants. And with that, that's how five other people were able to get into this industry and at least try and get it open. We were the first ones within he, which within his um, group that he picked, but everyone else is still in the pipeline to try and get open. And that's a really good thing because other than that, there was no chance we would have been in this industry to be open and to be thriving and to have Davies come to Brockton. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for that um, insight, Vanessa. And uh, though we don't wish death on anyone, right? No, we um, do not. We do not. We are, um, we're grateful that we were able to usher in change um, and that the right thing was able to be, you know, done by equity as it relates to cannabis and Brockton specifically. Um, again, is and, and we're kind of touching on the next question regarding barriers. Um, so I'm going to throw this one to, to here because you already kicked it off with talking about finances being a barrier to entry. Um, but according to a, a recent Leafly report, fewer than 2% of cannabis entrepreneurs nationwide are Black. Um, though you're not in Massachusetts, we're going to give some Massachusetts facts as well. In Massachusetts, despite launching a first in the nation equity program, 73% um, of active owners, executives, and employees and volunteers of cannabis establishments um, are white and 64% are male. So what are some of the barriers um, to entry and operation for traditionally marginalized communities? Wow. So every time, you know, just hearing those numbers, it, it never it never gets any better anytime you, um, you know, you hear that. Um, and, you know, what you described in Massachusetts, believe it or not, is the story in any state, um, any state you go to, it will typically be the same. Those numbers you said might actually might be a little better than um you know, the cannabis industry and a lot of other places. Um, but, you know, when it when you talk about barriers to entry, it, it really does start with a couple different things. For one, um, ex, I mean, to, to start off first, like I said it plainly before, access to capital is the biggest barrier to um, people of color being able to participate in the industry. If you talk about just the wealth that exists in communities of color, right, um, Black, Hispanic um, communities, we have less than one-tenth of the wealth of our counterparts. And so, Cannabis being federally illegal, you can't go into a bank to get a loan. So, um, you know, there's no, you, if you want to be access to the bank, you have to be either independently wealthy, have access to private, private equity, venture capital. Um, and if you look at those statistics, you see that, you know, that, 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 that type of funding barely goes to communities of color, whether we're talking about cannabis or not. So it really doesn't, it really doesn't give us a lot of um, opportunity to be able to participate. Um, you know, I'm sure Vanessa can talk about how how difficult it, I'm sure it was just to be able to, you know, fund a dispensary. You know, you, you hear all different types of figures of people saying that it could cost, you know, the applications that they spend, real estate. Um, I hear stories of people in Massachusetts that were paying thousands of dollars per month. You know, think about those types of things. It makes it very hard to be able to participate. And if you don't have that, you're not getting in the game. And that's before we address anything else. So we talk about education, right? Um, like the like the illicit market also people that have that people that have had years of experience dealing in cannabis they don't give us any credit um, you know for, you know for that participation and work that we've done so I think finding ways to actually educate um, and have structures so that people can um, you know like I said all this industry experience that people have had to be able to qualify and have a place in the industry is so important too um, also last but not least I think the stigma that exists from years of like, you know, years of policing in our communities probably keep some of the best and brightest people that could participate in cannabis out, right? 
if my whole life I've been told, you know, like you had the fear of being arrested, like, you know, you smoke, you're a bad person. If I've had the opportunity to build a professional career, um, you know, I'm, I'm, this will be the last thing I'm considering. So I think it's also important for us to go back and educate our communities and people about the opportunity that exists in the industry um, in general so that we can get um, you know, some of the some of the best, best and brightest um, people of color to participate in this industry as well, because, you know, that the important thing that you said about that number is not just the ownership, it's the executives in the C-suite, it's the, um, you know, it's those mid-level managers, it's all those people. And the more that we can have, you know, diverse leadership within these companies and these organizations, you know, we need to make this change from the inside. Um, you know, nobody's going to look out for your folks like, you know, like you're going to do it yourself. So we're going to talk about some trickle down stuff. That's what I want to see having some having some, you know, people of color in these organizations that can really try to make some change from within the inside. Um, you know, and those are just some of the um, things I think are important. Awesome. Thank you so much for that to hear. And, 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 and something that keeps resonating, both you and Cheney, um touched on it, was the importance of the legacy market. Um, I know we we tend to frame it as illicit. I, I won't do that, <laughs> not at this point, not given where we are, um, but I, I identified as the legacy market and understanding that those individuals, we literally are building off of their backs um, and their oppression, to be honest, in my opinion. Um, but understanding that also those individuals have the transferable skills, right? Like they're already doing it. They're already running businesses. We're already talking about ROI. They, I mean, when you can talk to me about flipping things and I'm like, oh, so you're great at money then. Then, we, you know, we start like really talking about it. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. So you're the person who goes out and makes sure that, you know, you have all of your folks together. So you're great at marketing then. That's marketing and promotions. Awesome. And it's like the look on their faces. It's like you just have to give them. I'm learning they have to understand, you give them the words, right? Like you're already doing the work, but here are the words. This is the way it's it's spoke to. This is how people speak to this. And this is how it's labeled within this particular round. But you already have the skills. So I think that that's, that's, that's really, really important. And I, and I think you both were really touching on that. Yeah, um, monopolized, but I just want to say, you know, I think that we, we want to, we need to claim that opportunity, right? We got to go back and educate our folks. You know, that's why these educational programs, like, you know, in any, in any um, legal market, like having a, having a system for like education, um, and like on the industry should be like, like one of the just essential key parts that has to exist. Yes, I agree. Um, Vanessa, hearing that, are there any other, in your experience, were there, are there any other barriers to entry that folks may not have a line of sight to that they should be aware of? Um, I would say the city process. That was something that we learned we, I didn't know anybody that did it. We didn't know anybody. It was just more so talking to people in the city and uh, we were connected to a city, um, a guy that does zoning. And with that, we were connected to his engineer. And then we were able to learn the process of what type of paperwork you need to provide to the city to get uh, approval, to get a special permit, to even get a building permit and get an inspection. Those are all things that like I knew nothing about. And we literally like step by step, took this chip data and just figured it out step by step. And I would say even when it comes like all that, that industry alone is there's not a lot of people that look like us in that industry and they make a lot of money. And that's something that I would definitely want to push people into. Even if you don't want to get into the marijuana industry and you are into computers and you like to design engineering is definitely where it's, where it's at. And like, there's, there's the inspectors, there's the, plumbers there's the electricians there's all of that that you don't really need to like some you need to go to school for but just the hands-on experience like and we're we, us being in the city we are doing our cultivation and we had to like clear out some stuff so we hired people within the city like kids not kids but like people that are 21 that um don't really have a lot going on with their lives but they are in the you know the streets or whatever and we're trying to individually take people and cheat them trade so they could like not be in the streets and even when it comes to like people that do sell drugs or whatever the list of the illicit market it's we started doing programs to where we could take people 
into from that illicit market and bring them into the legal market and it's more so like you said learning the terms and learning how to do it because it's also just taking product and flipping it and making a certain percentage off of it and doing that repeatedly and just keeping that money cash flow going and we're 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 trying man (laughs) we're trying one step at a time you're doing a great job I mean just to hear your efforts and the initiatives that you have going on like that's so completely different and outside of the box for many of the owners and operators in the space. Um, I know a lot of folks say that they want to do it, but for you to actually be doing it is something completely different. So I'm going to say kudos to you and give you your roses while you're here now for doing that thank work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and so I, another question that I have for you all is that Um, understanding that all equity programs are not created equal. We have Connecticut here, we have Oakland here, we got New Jersey, Massachusetts in the building. Um, Out of all of, and I know that we all have, you know, a line of sight to the different programs that exist. Um, In your opinion, again, (laughs) non-biased, what would you say is sort of one of the best, we won't say it's complete, right? We won't say it's finished, but even just great bones, like a great skeleton, like a great start. Um, In your opinion, which state do you think has the best um, equity program and why? Uh, Cheney. Well, of course, I'm going to say Oakland. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I mean, I'm really uh, proud of the work that has been done, you know, throughout the years, uh, even prior uh, to me joining, um, you know, uh, uh, the commission. Um, uh, Many folks um, was trailblazing and, you know, doing the groundwork, um, uh, operators and advocates um, uh, working side by side with, uh, you know, uh, some elected officials, but you're really starting to see a lot of that work. Um, uh, definitely, it, it's paid off, but it's continuing to pay off with um, some of the new programs, you know, that we have. Um, and and again, no. N- no equity program is perfect. Uh, the cannabis industry uh, isn't perfect. Um, <laughs> so let's just get that uh, uh, out there. But what I would have to say that, you know, the efforts that, you know, many people have made um, uh, in, uh, in Oakland, you know, uh, Massachusetts, um, uh, Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco, um, uh, you're really starting to see the work as equity programs um, uh, mature, right? Uh, this is still an evolving uh, uh, industry. But um, with that said, you know, in 2019, we were able to get some of the business tax lowered for uh, small inequity owned businesses. Uh, here in Oakland, majority of the operations that we have are uh, either equity owned or small. Uh, and I like, I always include, you know, small businesses because a fair amount of uh, small cannabis operations are owned by uh, women and people of color. Um, and they need some of the same uh, incentives that um, uh, equity applicants have uh, or equity operators have uh, in regards to, you know, some of the tax breaks uh, for them. Uh, to be able to, you know, to scale. Um, uh, Each year, you know, the state of California uh, through GoBiz uh, gives out, you know, um, uh, grants to uh, certain states that have uh, 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 legal programs uh, that are running. And, you know, Oakland, um, last year, we were able to secure about $6.5 million and, you know, distribute that um, amongst equity operators. Um, Also um, was able to um, uh, uh, open up uh, some um, uh, kitchens, a shared kitchen for um, uh, operators and also a shared manufacturing um, uh, facility uh, for, uh, for equity operators. And so really, starting to see as the industry and programs, you know, mature, how we were just talking about, you know, the, the redefining of language uh, as well. Um, I'm also seeing the need uh, on a local and state uh, level, um, uh, the need for um, uh, departments of cannabis that can 
be more accessible um, and um, dedicate, you know, uh, certain full-time services uh, to cannabis. So, yeah, again, I'm proud of the, the work that we're doing and that we're continuing to do and also seeing um, how it's, you know, influencing, you know, some of our uh, uh, other uh, affiliate cities uh, out there as well. Well, that's awesome. I, I had no idea about the, the tax reduction, which makes sense because if something, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Right. So when I think about higher um, institutions of learning um, and hospitals and, and some of the other buildings, I learned about this thing called pilot in Amazon um, payment in lieu of taxes. So basically these corporations and organizations get huge tax breaks for years. Like you don't pay any taxes as long as you'll bring your business here because it gives folks opportunities for jobs and things of that nature, right? Um, and then, but we don't apply that when we talk about equity and we talk about small businesses and we talk about businesses that are ran by people of color. Um, it just makes sense that we would use these same incentives to really make, um, I, I would say, owner you know ownership and, and operating easier for these particular organizations so kudos to you guys for thinking outside of the box <laughs> and 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 actually identifying what does work and applying them where they're applicable i know it sounds a bit rudimentary it sounds elementary but honestly it doesn't seem like government works that way a lot of times so <laughs> right and that's that's one of the reasons why you know and a lot of that you know it didn't come from you know uh, an elected official, you know, or the commissions, it, it really is, you know, um, people with their lived experiences, you know, as a former uh, operator, um, I know the difficulties, you know, of, of taxes. And so that's why it's really important, you know, for uh, uh, operators um, to attend, you know, whatever meetings going on in your city and, and let us know, like, what are the barriers so that we can try to address those issues. Awesome, and, and that actually leads us into our, our next question. Um, and Jason, I'm gonna direct this to you. Um, how can we promote action and eyelashship amongst industry stakeholders? And how can community members, advocates and nonprofit organizations, um, entrepreneurs, lobbyists, some of our favorite folks, um, partner to create an equitable and robust cannabis industry? Well, I think each one of those people may or may not want to create an equitable industry, right? <laughs> and so I, I think one thing that I definitely learned in Connecticut is be careful who's in the coalition, right? One thing in doing equity work, a lot of the folks are there for genuinely good reasons, and then we need resources to make things move. And so folks that are there for less than genuinely good reasons get pulled to the table, right? There were definitely people in Connecticut who I thought were my allies that were the impediment and not only like impediment, but actively work to overturn our equity policies in the process. Right. So what we're trying to do is undo 100 years of racism and economic exploitation with very narrow policies. Right. And so the opposition sees that if we catch fire with that, it's going to spread to lots of other things. Right. And so I don't think we can underestimate the fear of the typical capitalists that are not wanting us to come in and be the competition. And thus we have to be more selective on who in that group do we allow actually to be determine the policies. And in a weird way, unfortunately, the way we were able to get just about anything passed in Connecticut was by being the opposition and saying, you're not gonna pass this bill unless you have our support in doing this. That was without a doubt a controversial position. There are definitely people that are probably mad at me for all kinds of things that happened throughout that process, right? And so I adopted the framing that what I saw in other states was folks were willing to accept weak equity programs that then turn into incredible complications later. And I didn't wanna repeat that mistake, right? And I knew though that they really wanted to pass it for their own political reasons, right? So we did it by setting the stage of who we thought should be the deciders, right? We brought in the Native American tribes to come and do, you know, specific policy on how they want to interact in the industry. We brought in the unions to decide how they want to participate in the industry. We brought in student activists to decide how our young people are going to participate in the industry. And then our table said, these are our demands by introducing our own bill, right? We did not rely on the industry or anybody else 
for their language. And this is a big thing I learned with MCBA was we continue to lose anytime we're fighting over somebody else's bill, right? It's just like any contract, right? That is written by somebody else is gonna benefit them, right? And so let's start writing the contracts and we make the proposals of what is gonna pass or not. And so it was incredibly difficult to mobilize traditionally exploited and financially oppressed communities together to fight billionaires, right? Like we're literally talking about both our governor is a billionaire and the people that own the industry are billionaires. In that though, there was some very clear, <clears throat> powerful processes I think with linking equity and home grow was very important, right? And that our access to being able to interact with the plant for an intellectual reason, for a medical reason, whatever it may be, is the foundation of equity. If I can't touch the plant, let alone start a business, we're not on the right page. But that also meant that there were a lot of folks like myself, right, that were very much interested in the criminal justice side and a huge swath of white folks and all everything in between that were like, at bare minimum, like home grow and helping the people that got arrested is what we're doing here, right? So we were in agreement on that. And we put that out there, is this what we're gonna get? What I thought was challenging was we made a list, we had seven things we wanted to get home grow, Native American tribes, labor peace agreements. We got all seven. What I wasn't expecting was them to come up with whole new ridiculous programs that I needed to oppose, right? Where there was the equity joint ventures proposed in Connecticut that would have said, a MSO, multi-state operator, there's only four cultivators in the entire state of Connecticut, would each be able to choose two equity applicants that would be able to skip the lottery and go in front of everybody and start a business, although in the actual bill it said they would own 5% of that business. So if this program was going to move forward, and it kind of did in some capacities, that meant there'd be eight equity businesses that jump in front of everybody else creating the new equity cohort for the first market, 95% owned by MSOs, 95%, right? We oh no. I didn't expect, right? Like I didn't know to oppose that. Uh, and that was something that, you know, are we gonna derail the other programs to stop this bad policy? Because that's clearly creating an unequitable program that's in control of the MSOs, right? But does that mean we're gonna say the $50 million in bonding for startup funds that we were able to secure, are we gonna tank that over this other weird thing, right? And so I think it's important that folks have their lines in the sand, uh, but also know when we have to take a few W's and keep it moving. Right, because now we have an equity program in Connecticut, right? That exists now. There is a definition, I don't like it, but it exists and I can build on that, right? Mm -hmm. Homegrow is gonna take longer than I expect, but in two years we will have homegrow, right? If we just tank the whole thing, none of that would be in existence as we started from scratch. So it's very complicated who you want at the table, right? Who's gonna help you eat and what exactly y'all are trying to accomplish. But the more that you can find foundational values that differentiate between those who are there and who are there for other nefarious reasons and, and really put that in policy, is it home growth? Is it ownership? Is it reentry, right? Like, and make those incredibly strong. I think whoever is there, whether they're there for good reasons or not, are helping you push in the right direction. And if not, you gotta say, you gotta go fam, you're not here to do the same things that we're here to do. Okay, that sounds, I, I, as, um, as much as you gave us that, I, as much as you gave us just then, I, it makes really, it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so one, know what you want, <laughs> two, Make sure that the right people are in the room having the right conversation. Three, ensure that you continue to show up because even though you have the right people in the room, you know what you want and you ask for it, it doesn't mean you're going to get it. And sometimes things happen where the opposite occurs. So keep showing up so that you can make sure that you're, you're making noise and, and you're getting your demands met. Um, so did I, I think, I think we pretty much we talk, I hope I summarize that <laughs> for everyone correctly. Um, and we, we have so many questions that are coming in. I want to make sure that we get to them. So I don't mean to skip around, but I do have one question that I want to ask. Um, oftentimes when we talk about equity, we're looking at it from a needs-based perspective. So what do we need to achieve equity, right? And when I, I, I sat with this and I thought about it and I pondered it and I was just like, you know what? 
it always, it seems to carry a negative connotation, right? Because it's like, oh, you're asking for something. Like, what do you want? Like, what do you need? Why do you need this? This doesn't make any sense. But what we never really, or what is rarely done is that we identify the value, right? And you being an outlier. So a question that I have for you all is, let's, if we flip, if we flip the, prescri- uh, the perspective um, and looking at this from that lens, what, what type of, I want to say what type of value, right? And and what type of ROI can a social equity applicant expect? Like, how can they set themselves aside in this market to say, yes, I may not be, I may not fall in line with mainstream, I may not be a part of the majority, but being a minority, here's what I do have, and here's what I can do to shine. That not only, yes, am I different, but I'm actually going to be able to capitalize off of that. Um, Vanessa, I'm going to throw it to you first, given, you know, <laughs> that you're operating now. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, I would say to anybody that is inspiring to get into this industry, do not give up. Do not let anybody talk you out of it. There's going to be people that are going to solicitate you, that is going to bring you off the veer to, I mean, off the path of where you're trying to go. Just literally stay focused in what you want and how you want it and don't settle for anything else because it's hard out here, man. It's hard (laughs) out here for a pimp and... (laughs) To get open, there was a lot of distractions. There's a lot of people that will give you false hope and just linger you along just because they see that you're getting to a farther state. And it's just like, just, just stay focused at it. Just just literally stay focused at it. That's my Thank you. Um, to here, <laughs> do you have anything to, to add to that? Yeah, you know, I would say... Um, you know, even if you don't have, you know, um, the, the, I know it's talked a lot about the barriers, but even if you don't necessarily have, you know, the capital, um, I think one thing to never forget is like the importance of the culture and like the, what, what you bring to the table with that, right? I think um, last night I had the opportunity to attend um, my brothers from New York Happy Monkeys um, event, right? And they, they, they did an art gallery, man. And this is a, in New York, right? Um, New York's legalized weed, they took advantage of that. They found a way to say, you know, hey, how can we capitalize on this opportunity that exists in the industry to to do an event there? So just never forget, um, you know, the value of what you bring through the culture. That's something they can't recreate. Money can't buy that. No, no MSO can put no, no, not millions of dollars can, can buy that culture and they can't buy that reality, that connection to the plant and the people. So I was just say always continue to focus on that and use that as your strength. And like like Vanessa said, just keep working hard, hustle hard, um, on the like, you know, stay on the grind, learn everything you can about this, be persistent. Um, and you know, there's there's no there's there's no way that you can't do the, anything that you set out to do. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Cheney. Yeah, I wanted to add something as well. Um we talk a lot of focus on plant touching, but folks need to also know about the opportunities about you know non uh, plant touching businesses that you can start that actually has easier pathways you know into the industry. Um, uh, there's many people who have been harmed by the war on drugs who have uh, skills that are transferable into uh, into cannabis. We're talking about a whole um, industry that needs support and it's just not the plant, right? Uh, there's uh, so many opportunities in, uh, in tech, um, also uh, finance. Um, uh, if you are an artist, graphic artist, um, states that are on the way you know to legalizing people in states like new york and uh other other states um think outside the box right and if your goal is to get to a plant touching business that's fine but you can you know of course it doesn't take anything to advocate but um if you do have those skills i know i met a woman whose family um owned a hvac company for 25 years i'm like you're actually 
in the business. You have a business that is needed, you know, in cannabis. You don't have to pay exuberant fees for a license. You don't have to worry about the taxes and, you know, everything else. And so, you know, I just want uh, folks out there to also remember that um, uh, look at what you can contribute that doesn't have to do with uh, plant touching that uh, can be utilized uh, uh, in the industry. Thank you for bringing up that point. And Jason, I see your finger. What do you want to add? Real quick, just as we're legalizing, not demonizing the drug dealer is going to make it a lot easier for folks that have been operating their whole lives on license to be treated with respect. I think there is this idea that we have to throw certain communities under the bus, which sets it up where corporate is the only way to get out of these bad cartel members, right? Like, so as we legalize, we're doing it because the wars are bad, not because other folks in our communities want to hurt people, right? And I want to make sure that as we go through the process, we're not making things more difficult by demonizing our own community, thinking that only corporate folks can sell safe cannabis. We've been selling it for a long time. And the profit incentive is just as a big of a reason why folks might cut corners as anything else, you know, as far as big business goes. So I just want to make sure we start out not demonizing our own communities because it will make it much easier for the future boards, future you know, elected officials to treat all of us with respect. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, so we wanna make sure that we get to some of our questions. Um, and I have, I have a really good one here. Um, so how would you establish and or expand on equity in a vertically integrated state containing conservative views? Um, I found advocacy to be a major focal point. However, navigating municipalities and city counseling, city councils, I'm guessing, seems limited to the emotions of the respected governor, agricultural commissioner, and whomever in between. Um, Cheney, did you want to take that question? Both them out. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. We, we have to look at the elected officials who are your electeds that, you know, are, are anti, you know, uh, affordable housing and access, you know, who in your, you know, uh, city uh, um, didn't advocate, you know, for uh, uh, equity in your schools, right? Like, look at all of that, because more than likely, they're not going to uh, support cannabis and vote them out. Because there is somebody who does support it. Um, if we know that you are in a state that is um, blatantly racist, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's how, how do we strategically, you know, fight it, right? And um, I would say there's, there's much more to it, but if you just want to get directly to the answer, <laughs> <Vote about. laughs> get to the root cause, <laughs> um, find out how you can remove these people out of their seats and replace them with people, you know, who can. Um, it's it, cannabis is a, it's a racial issue. It's also a health equity, you know, issue. There's, uh, there's conservatives who are, who have cancer, <laughs> who have, you know, other, uh, underlying, you know, health issues. And so how can we speak to those, um, uh, uh, issues, right? And so vote them out, find people who will support, uh, you know, the efforts that, uh, that, you know, that you're fighting for and, uh, you know, get to work. It's all boots on the ground. You know, like Vanessa was saying, this isn't, this isn't easy, whether you're an operator or an advocate. Yes. I, and I love the fact that you, you hit the two points that, you know, often folks don't think about though. It's quick. It's easy to tell you who not to vote for. Right. But tell me who to vote for and why. So I think that that's really important, making sure that, yes, we move the folks out of position who are not representing the communities that they serve and their interests and their desires, um, but making sure that we do the work to support and to get those in place who are. So thank you for adding that. That's, that's, that's really significant. Um, so Vanessa, this is a great question. What was the type of training you went through that allowed you to open your own dispensary? I had no training. <laughs> so it's literally, we had, we, it, it, me, Legal Greens consists of me, my partner, Mark, and my other partner, Mike. 
And I would say it was a team effort because I was more so the one that did the application that filled out all the forms and stuff that I was like the administrator. That was my role in filling out the applications into the state. And then my partner, Mark, who was a, um, a manager at Walgreens for like 18 years. So he knew how to manage and how to run a store. And that was his focal point. And as well as doing the build out, he went to school for construction and stuff. So that was his cup of tea. He loved it. He did an amazing job. Like the decorations, is, he's, he's great. And then Mike, who was our attorney, as well as our other business partner, he felicitated like the deals. He got the money that um, we needed to open our store and that we it was just a, a team collective on how we did it it wasn't more so one person did everything and everyone else just stood by everyone played their role and did what they did best and that's how we were able to open and open fast <laughs> also um thank you for sharing that <laughs> everyone <laughs> brought their own particular talents to the table so that's what we meant by those yeah. transferable skills yeah. right um, yes. So I'm, I'm pretty sure as he was in Walgreens, like, yes, on the inside, he may have been dreaming of cannabis, but I'm pretty sure no one was looking at him like, he's going to run a dispensary one day. And yeah, you <laughs> so, know, but he, he has the skills. So whatever business, whatever you like, to, you're going to do, yeah. <laughs> but it makes sense, right? Walgreens, <laughs> drugstore, cannabis, it works together. I mean, in my <laughs> mind, it makes sense. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So another question that we have is, ooh, this is kind of a spicy one. Um, how can the women in my cohort, uh, most of minorities, stand out and get ahead in the sea of males? Most are Caucasian. So I think by default, we should have a female answer that question first. Sorry, guys. It just seems right to me. <laughs> Shady, did you want to give it a try? Sure. Um, you know, this, this industry can be very intimidating. You know, you're having to, you're in a uh, predominantly um, white male uh, industry. Um, the advice I have is not uh, political or anything like that. Just take, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Um, take care of your mental <laughs> and spiritual, you know, uh, space as much as you can. Um, surround yourself with good people, um, a support system, people that, you know, you can talk to, find other women, Black women in cannabis that you can, you know, build uh, with, you know, outside of the conferences and, you know, um, uh, social media, right? Because sometimes, you might need to uh, call somebody and uh, people, other friends might not understand where you're coming from because they're not in this space. So find a community and a support system that, you know, you can um, really, you know, build with and be unapologetic. You know, people will tell you, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, you know, they won't center your voice. They won't believe you. Um, don't let any of that uh, deter you from what your actual mission is. Uh, some of the, um, the strongest people that I know in this industry are black women um, who are, you know, who are the shit and doing the damn thing, you know, and are leading um, uh, across the board, whether it's, you know, on policy or opening, you know, dispensaries or, you know, um, advocating. And so, you know, we're out there. Um, and for non-Black women, support the Black women who are in this space. Um, and when they come to you, you know, listen and, uh, uh, you know, just try to, yeah, just try to listen and support, you know, however, you know, you can. But um, I have literally been in spaces to where I've just had to stand up and let my voice, you know, be heard because as the minority in the room, and also as someone who is, you know, um, uh, non-binary, um, that's a whole other, you know, you know, space. So really, you know, um, believe in yourself 
and don't let anyone tell you differently than you know what what you believe. Oh, thank you so much for that. Now that was right on. <laughs> no one, I promise you, I've I've asked that question probably about mm, six to seven different ways. And no one has ever said to take care of yourself. That's the very first time I have ever heard that response. And it's so important. It's critical um, to all of the work that we do, despite what it is. Take yeah. care of yourself first. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. For Black women. The yeah, right. Women, so <laughs> you got to center yourself first because ain't nobody else going to do it. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, I won't go down, you know, into my Malcolm X feel. Uh, the most disrespected person in America is the black woman, you know. Um, but yes, for us to to all like, you know, again, take care of ourselves first, but to also find like minds and individuals. Um, and there are, I want to make sure we don't, you know, that we do recognize our allies because they do exist. So anyone who is an ally who extends platforms, who gives opportunities, you know, just just to show up and to be us in that space, it says a lot. Um, and moreover, when we're able to actually show that we we have the capacity to exchange ideas and to communicate clearly and to advocate and to bring folks along is, is also great. So thank you and shout out to our allies. <laughs> we appreciate you. Um, and we're gonna, I, I think this is a good question to end on. Um, to hear, I'm gonna toss this over to you. Um, what strategies are you using to create justice and fairness within a system that is built on injustice and racism? Oh, you're on mute. Right oh, my bad. That was not the unmute button I hit. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I think one of the, um, like really one of the important things is, um, is to understand and recognize the um, the history of cannabis and the impact that we've had of prohibition. Um, I think Jason touched on this a little bit. Cannabis and, and is not just about building the industry. It's not just about economic profits, but it's also about restoring the harm of the war on drugs. So as we look at cannabis, again, this is it's not just business and we're talking about the legalization, but the importance of um, fixing that. And I think that diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, including people of color, um, including people that have been victims of the war on drugs and like breaking this stigma, building all of that is a, you know, is a part of that. So I think it's, like I said, it's, it's building this narrative about, um, you know, what we want to create and what we want to see and being very um, unapologetic, like Cheney said, being, you know, taking ownership of that and not, you know, we're not, you know, knowing that we can't accept anything less. And it's also getting the buy-in and not just come from people from the social equity communities, but that allyship is important because it does take getting the buy-in from, um, you know, from also businesses, um, multi-state operators, everybody involved, because this isn't just something that benefits us. It's something that benefits everybody. So that's what I think is important. Oh, thank you so much for that. Um, any other closing ideas or thoughts as it relates to equity and allyship? Jason? So first, I just made a comment about allyship being a verb, right? Like you don't get to anoint yourself an ally, like you should be doing it over and over and over again. And so like, there's even one time, I remember a, a situation where Shaleen Title was speaking at a conference and I had to interrupt somebody that interrupted her, right? And so she is very much a credible spokesperson, right? But I remember in that moment, the amount of folks that were like upset with me for interrupting him versus how many folks are upset for him interrupting her was like worlds different, right? And so it was a very interesting moment for me in the cannabis industry to see that. But I think one principle that is true in cannabis and all community organizing is that collective action is the most powerful force on the planet, right? And so whenever we're talking about how we're gonna do something or whether or not we can accomplish something, it's a matter of how collectively can we move together on something towards a common cause. The big corporations have all this money and that's how they can do massive collective action because it's wealthy folks collectively acting together, right? So I think teaching each other the art of community organizing and not thinking of drug policy as separate from the history of community organizing and progressive and social justice oriented movements to go to those movements and say, 
how did you run meetings? How did you form a coalition of different stakeholders, right? And really learning from the history of community organizing that came before us is something that I think all of us can share with each other that frequently gets left out in a world of like policy specifics, right? So the more that we can share some of that information as far as how to just run campaigns, and I think that's where SSDP and Students for Sensible Drug Policy really come in, right? We train folks on how to do that. I got trained through SSDP on how to do that. So ensuring that young folks have access to those resources and all community members, right? So if there's one thing I could say is really folks should think about pulling in the knowledge of other movements to the drug policy movement uh, and then applying them in our local context. Thank you for that. Um, that's, that's really important. Don't recreate the wheel, right? Let's use what works. Um, Cheney, did you have any closing ideas or thoughts you wanted to share regarding equity and allyship? Um, yes, and 100% to everything that, you know, uh, Jason just said, um, cannabis, it intersects with a lot of the social issues that we have. And so um, in a city, you know, like Oakland, that has, um, that's, you know, really is a center for uh, community, you know, organizing, um, there are uh, already uh, uh, individuals and organizations that can contribute, you know, to this movement. And that said, you know, um, uh, across the country. Um, what I would say is that, you know, um, yes, we need, we need more advocates. We need more, uh, we need more allies. You know, it's definitely not enough out there. There's more people that's uh, with no cannabis knowledge that's interested in opening a dispensary <laughs> versus then trying to change policy that would allow uh, other people um, coming from the legacy market to have, you know, more equitable pathways. And so um, uh, I would say if you, you know, are an ally or someone who is considering uh, supporting this movement, you know, uh, follow the folks on this, you know, on, on, on this panel. I know a lot of the people attending, you know, already do, but talk to other people, you know, uh, uh, that don't, um, because we need that, that support as we're moving, you know, uh, towards uh, a federal legalization. A lot of the work that, you know, most of us here are doing are, you know, in legalized states, just trying to make it actually, actually equitable, right? Like they pass programs, but it's still, you know, uh, isn't enough. Um, of course, access to capital. So if you're a person of, of privilege who is in a, a position um, to, you know, offer uh, resources or uh, capital to somebody, do it. You know, um, or if you're in a circle of people, bring that circle over, uh, you know, to to these individuals and, you know, and help them um, um, uh, open up and, and, and get their licenses. But yes, more, more uh, allyship uh, is needed. And I, I kind of actually hate using that word, more support is, is, is needed. Um, we need more support uh, uh, in general. And so um, if, if folks wanna support those efforts, get involved, um, uh, follow the people, attend the meetings, help us do the work. Awesome. So reach one, teach one, empower one. We'll add that last step in there. <laughs> it's a process. Um, Vanessa, do you have anything to share with us? Any closing remarks on equity and allyship? Um, just a closing remark would be to not to demonize the people in the listed market or the legacy market, I would say. Um, for the simple fact that they're the ones that started this and they're the ones that are still getting arrested for this. And it's something that we need to take a priority on and not just, I guess, regular folks trying to get in, but more so trying to get the people that have already been doing this into the legal market and showing them how to do it and showing them the steps on how to stay open and all that good stuff. Cause other than that, all these big corporations are just going to make more money off of people that are still going to jail. That's my closing remarks. And I think what's interesting, and I, I'm pretty sure all of us respect the plant here, right? And, 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 and the quality comes along with it. 
I myself find, you know, in my few dabbles and moments with the legacy market that if I'm looking for fire, that's why I'm going to find fire. But that's just me. You know, I'm pretty sure you have fire and legal greens too, Vanessa, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> yeah, this my is own personal this shopper, is you know. <laughs> The streets are calling. <laughs> <laughs> the streets are calling. I love it. Um, well, listen, I, I really, really want to thank you all for being here with us this evening. Um, you have brought so much value to this conversation. Um, I really hope that the community enjoyed it as much as I did. I feel like I've been sitting and talking to a group of my friends for the past hour and a half, and we were only supposed to do this an hour. Um, so thank you all so much. I um, want to make sure that we thank our sponsors again. So MCR Labs, thank you so much for being a series sponsor. Rise, we truly appreciate you supporting and sponsoring this particular event. Um, to our community partners, we love you, Eon, M4MM. Much, much, much love. Thank you so much for all of your love and support over the years. Uh, we're hoping to continue to build and grow with you all. Um, and I cannot, I cannot, I have to name, we're going to name everyone. Thank you so much to Cheney. Thank you so much to Tahir. Thank you so much, Vanessa. And last but definitely not least, thank you so much, Jason, for joining us this evening. You all are phenomenal. Um, if there's, let's make sure we all stay in touch to continue to support each other and make sure that we're all staying well and uplifted. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Um, and, and this has been us. And we're going to sign off now. Take care, everyone. Bye. Uh, take care. Thank you. Go get that money. <laughs> <laughs> Peace, y'all. <laughs>